Aunty Sumitra, I can hear you. Ah, uh, yeah, got it. So we will be going live in another one minute. Sure. Uh, your voice is not audible. Again, slow. Just. Yes. <clears throat> is it audible now? Yeah, this is. Yeah, this is okay. Oh, I think to me slow. Hmm. Uh, Ma'am, we are now live. Okay, so we are live and uh, just a moment. Harsh, please give me the uh, uh, the permission to record this session. Just give me a minute. Hello everyone, good evening. This is Komal Tyagi from Team Taxman, welcoming you all to today's live webinar on GST input tax credit in relation to construction services. I will start with a brief about Taxman. We are the leading publisher of tax and corporate laws in India. We maintain the largest and the most accurate online database on income tax, international taxation, GST, company and SEBI law, IBC, FEMA Banking and NBFC, Competition Law, Accounts and Audit, and Indian Acts and Rules. Over the years, we have worked strenuously to offer the solutions that will continue to help you grow your practice. Our six decades of experience in the domain has helped us to constantly innovate and enhance our services and take the tax practice to a newer height. We have also developed the national website of the Income Tax Department and we maintain it with the help of our technical team and the editorial. Now I introduce our speaker for the evening, Mr. Gaurav Narula. Mr. Narula has over 11 years of experience advising clients on indirect tax laws and LMA laws. He has advised multinational and domestic clients across various sectors such as manufacturing, retail, automobile parts, IT, ITS, and logistics, etc. He has helped them transition smoothly into the GST regime. Before Nitya, he worked with BMR and Associates LLP in their indirect tax practice. Gaurav is a member of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of India, having held an All India Merit position in CA Finals. Gaurav also holds a Bachelor's degree in Commerce from the University of Delhi. Welcome, Mr. Gaurav. Now, before we proceed, here are some tips for the participants. Your mic, mic will be on mute. However, you may post your questions in the chat box available. Your questions will be answered by the speaker during this session or after the session by our R&D team. A copy of the presentation on the subject matter shall also be sent to you in email for your future references. Now, without taking much time, I request Mr. Gaurav Narula to address the audience. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Sumita, for such a lovely introduction. Thank you, Taxman, for giving us this opportunity to present uh, to the lovely audience uh, about one of the complex issues. Uh, good evening to the participants who have taken out time to attend this interesting session. Uh, today, as Sumita said, we would be discussing a lot about uh, construction related services, goods, and service tax positioning on that and key entry cases which are relevant for these kinds of transactions. Today, we would be covering the relevant legal provisions dealing with construction services, the recent judicial pronouncements on the subject, what should be the learning way forward for the taxpayers under the GST for these services, and at the end, we will try to address questions and answers from the participants. With this, we will open up the session. Under GST, government took note of various complications which were there under the old law. They somehow tried to give a more realistic and balanced approach on construction services. 
the intent was to disallow credit on civil work and to permit credit on other ancillary services especially the plant and machinery so with this background they created the various provisions of uh, construction services but of late what has happened multiple advance ruling have come up on this point where they have touched upon different different interpretation of the law i must say this has created this provision more complex rather than to simplify that and this is going to be the main pillar of this seminar that how advance ruling has dealt with these uh, provisions in the real world so we will understand the quick overview about the construction services so from a practical standpoint if any manufacturer has to incur construction expenses these can broadly be categorized into two categories routine repair and maintenance expenses which are being charged to profit and loss account and the long term capex now this could be in the form of building this could be in the form of plant and machinery this could be in the form of storage tanks power plants etc so broadly all the construction expenses are divided into two categories from the gst standpoint the gst law provides twin tests to claim import tax credit the first condition flows from section 16 that uh, the expense has to be in the course or percentage of business second they have created two exception under the negative list where the input tax credit has been restricted on construction expenses we'll deal all these conditions in detail in coming slides now these two conditions have two category section 175c and section 175d section 175c talks about where we have taken a box contract service and that is being used for construction of immovable property on that credit is not allowed only in two scenarios credit on works works contract service is allowed scenario 1 where works contract service is used for construction of plant and machinery and second where works contract service is used to provide outward works contract service so say for an example you got a construction contract you subcontracted a part of this contract to a subcontractor subcontractor is billing you under the category of works contract services and you are billing under the works contract services to the customer so input works contract service would be eligible as credit towards the output works contract service and the second exception is under section 175 where there is a use of any goods or services which results in creation of immovable property and importantly this immovable property is being used for oneself so let's say if you <coughs> did a major expansion you uh, created a, a a structure in the building in terms of expansion of boundaries etc then credit of goods and services will not be available again there is one exception the exception is when goods and services are used for construction of plant and machinery that is being used for capital consumption so let's say you installed a, a solar power plant you incurred goods and services cost for you know creation of this solar plant that's being used for creation of electricity which is used in production then credit on the construction of plant and machinery would be admissible so what are the key disputed areas when we discuss the credit part of, on the construction related services the first and foremost is what qualifies to be immovable property unfortunately immovable property is not defined under gst law and this is one of the pillar to give you the credit hence uh, there are references taken from other act but most importantly this subject has been a dispute under the earlier vat regime and excise regime as well similar disputes are coming under gst regime as well because if the works contract service results in creation of movable property then credit is available so what constitutes immovable property is something which always remains a matter of interpretation under the immovable property there is a debate between movability and non movability non movability second now whatever is the immovable property are we only talking about the civil work which means a uh, building shed 
or are we talking about a civil work plus the plant or machinery which is attached with this civil work for example a shed plus the ac ducting or fire extinguishing system so how would you read the involved property what is the meaning of involved property uh, from this perspective is also important you will see in comments like that most of the disputes are falling into this basket where taxpayer believes that plant and machinery is not including uh, civil work as part of immovable property whereas the revenue is interpreting the word immovable property to mean some total of both civil work and plant and machinery which is attached to the civil work then the stand alone civil work is it really a civil work or a plant and machinery like there has been uh, scenarios where a subject matter is being debated whether it qualifies to be a civil work or a plant and machinery that is the second category of dispute third when you have incurred expenses to create a property and then property is onward given on rent lease let out etc then whether the credit is admissible or not we will study a lot of jurisprudence on this part now there is also the concept of capitalization uh, we will study this concept in detail but yes how would you read the capitalization so for example if you have incurred an expense and you have capitalized it under the heading plant and machinery will it qualify to be the plant and machine machinery or let's say this has some nexus with the immovable property whether it would be a part and parcel of immovable property and vice versa if a product was an improvement in terms of plant and machinery but capitalized under the head of lease hold improvements whether credit will be available or not we will test that and lastly again uh, the definition of plant and machinery definition gives a very expanded scope and then at a later part they have created some exclusion but unfortunately even if the definition is uh, very wide uh, the authorities are interpreting it to be a part and parcel of immovable property trying to disallow the credit so what next in the subsequent slides we will be dealing with the intricacies of each and every point we will lay down some standard tests which should be rightly applied to understand the tax position let me acknowledge that uh, it's not going to be a session in black and white because you will see that even authorities are confused or they are on one ar they are allowing credit on ac ducting system and other ar is disallowing those credits so we will not be able to conclude on the specific item whether credit is admissible or not but we will touch upon all this concept we will see what the law asks and what could be the standard benchmarks to understand whether we should claim credit in x scenario or in y scenario so that's going to be the intention of this webinar to quickly sum up itc is not available when goods and services are used for construction of immovable property exception is when you have used services for supply of other works contract or for creation of plant and machinery and the construction is being defined to include reconstruction renovation addition alteration or repair to the extent it has been capitalized so if it is not a fresh construction but there is a reconstruction of the existing immovable property addition or alteration and to the extent that that expense is being capitalized in books of account it qualifies to be the construction so which means credit is not admissible on this part Well, let's start understanding uh, the legal language. So, to reiterate, credit is not available on works contract service when it is supplied for construction of immovable property other than plant and machinery, and credit is allowed when it is an input service for further supply of works contract service. Now, let us understand what is the definition of works contract service. So, works contract is defined. to mean a contract for building construction fabrication and so on relating to an immovable property so that's the interesting part under gst they have restricted the definition of works contract only to the immovable property 
If it is in relation to movable property, which means any construction, fabrication, completion related to movable property, that is not a works contract service. That could be composite supply or individual supply, which means work done on movable property is anyway allowed as credit. There is no restriction under section 17.5 for that category. Hence, this test is very important. If we are doing similar work of construction fabrication for inward property, credit is not allowed. If we are doing it for mobile property, then credit is allowed. The definition further says it is a transfer of property in goods during the process. So this is the historic concept which continues. The important point is it has to be in relation to an immovable property, not movable property. Construction includes reconstruction, renovation, additional alteration, repair to the extent of capitalization. Now, if we have done a construction, reconstruction, addition, and expense is being charged to PNL, then credit is allowed. Let's say there is a routine repair and maintenance of the building, which may include renovation, addition, or alteration, and the expense is being charged to profit and loss account, credit is allowed. Building remains to be an immobile property. Even then, the credit is allowed. But if it is a major expense which is being capitalized in books of accounts, then the credit is disallowed. So, somewhere the law has consciously went into the concept of capitalization to allow a credit or to disallow a credit in relation to immobile property. Hence, this concept is going to be another round of dispute. Uh, in the present regime and we see few jurisprudence on this part. But for the moment, if it is a revenue expense, then credit is allowed. But if it is being capitalized, then credit is not allowed. Now, the other part of the definition talks about what is an immobile property. So, we studied box contract definition, we studied the construction concept. Now, let us understand the most complex part. What construed to be an immobile property? Now, like I said, it is not being defined in GST. So, we have to go to General Clauses Act to understand this part. The General Clauses Act first defined movable property. It says it means anything which is not immovable. And then it gives a detailed definition of immovable property. It says immovable property includes land. It also includes benefit to arise out of land and things attached to the earth. Let's say uh, an orchid tree which is attached, so it becomes part and parcel of the uh, land and, and becomes an immune property. Or permanently fastened to anything attached to the earth, something which is permanently fastened that qualifies to be the immune property. How the concept of attached to earth is being explained, it is being given in the section 3. It says Either it is rooted into the earth, which is tree and shrubs, which means tree and shrubs would be a part and parcel of immoral property. Something which is embedded in the earth, that is wall and building. So, which means land, wall and building together would constitute to be an immoral property. And something which is attached in such a manner that it is for permanent beneficial enjoyment. Let's say a functional uh, structure. Uh, which is there, which has a permanency over the land. For example, a prefabricated building. So, you created a prefabricated building, a well designed specific to a particular land area, and that has been permanently attached. of permanent enjoyment even for enjoyable property. So, I'll just pause here and I just want you to see how complex the interpretation of immoral property is being given. And this is the reason why even courts or the advanced ruling authorities are not very clear what should be included, what should not be included. Most specifically, the test of attached to earth for permanently fastened for permanent, permanent beneficial enjoyment. This provision brings a lot of subjectivity in the way the transaction or the subject matter is being looked up by the taxpayer and the way the subject matter is being looked up by the authority. 
if you ask me what are the tests how should we understand whether the property is being created for permanent enjoyment or not i say there is no straight jacket formula based on various supreme court judgments in the past or based on the current judgments we can discuss two three criteria basis which we can decide whether a particular subject matter is there as permanent or it is there as temporary the first test is can we move the particular product as such like with a simple dismantling if this can be moved as such without being product moved into ckd skd format second the object of annexation now annexation would object here would mean the intention like i gave you an example of prefabricated building so if somebody is designing a prefabricated building theoretically it can be argued that i can dismantle the building move it out to some other place and then recreate or reassemble the building but when a contract for prefabricated building is given the intention always is to run the factory from those buildings which means the intention is there this building should stay here for a long term period hence the intention always has been to create a permanent structure even though it can be removed without uh, causing much trouble degree of annexation means the method the process that's being used between the building and the earth how solid robust you have attached the things to the earth if it is attached in such a manner that it is practically next to impossible to take the structure out of uh, this uh, earth then it qualifies to be uh, a, a permanent test it qualifies to be a uh, immobile property i'll give you a few more examples suppose you designed a conference uh, a dedicated conference table now the intention is this conference table will fit into the size of conference room it would be permanently attached it will have all uh, the wires the laptops connectors uh, projectors etc so then again it qualifies to be an immobile property because this is the intention nobody intends to move a conference room from the building so these are the tests that's been uh, applied another test is wobble free movement if somebody says that you know the machine is being attached just to smoothen the operation not with the intent of permanent fixation then it can be argued that this is a movable structure not the immovable structure now i would like to reiterate that uh, the test of movability and immovability is only relevant for non planted machinery items like building furniture etc if it is in relation to a plant or machinery item then credit is admissible per se even if it is an immovable property because we have given such a complex definition hence there are too many divergent interpretations especially on plant or machinery which are somewhere connected with building or civil structure like ac ducting ahus fire fighting systems telephone lines etc and like i said this test is irrelevant for plant and machinery to claim credit so what is the reality the reality is the way authorities are reading it down in our property they are taking a view that in all property is some total of civil work plus plant and machinery whereby they are eliminating the plant and machinery uh, from the definition they are reading it to be a civil work and then the definition says credit on works contract service shall not be available for construction of immovable property now here they are reading immovable property to mean civil work plus the plant and machinery so to that extent there are numerous er triple errors which have come which have denied credit on plant and machinery which are affixed to immovable property let us understand what is the definition of plant and machinery so plant and machinery is being defined in a very wide manner it says it includes the apparatus equipment and machinery which means if the expense is being incurred for construction of apparatus equipment machinery then credit is available plant and machinery means things which are attached to earth by a foundation or structure and what it excludes which means credit on works contract service for creation of these items is not admissible telecom towers land building or civil structure 
and pipeline which is laid outside the factory. So on these items, credit will not be applicable. Now again, apparatus, equipment, machineries are not being defined. If we take the general meaning from the definitions from the dictionary, then a practice would mean a compound instrument which is designed to carry out a specific function. Equipment is assembling of various functions to perform a complete function like a UPS system. Machinery here it means that uh, it's some uh, combination of mechanical devices uh, which are interrelated, interdependent to perform a particular function. So that there is a defined or specific result out of that. So here you will notice that apparatus, equipment, machinery that's been defined uh, in a very wide manner. Hence, most of the uh, construction related work, you know, could fit in into this category. Okay, I just stay here. Now the point is, how should we create a distinction? What qualifies? be a plant and machinery for the purpose of clause C or the upcoming clause C and what qualifies to be an immobile property because the, what the law is, law is it is an input box contract service for creation of immobile property then credit is not allowed but credit would be allowed when the resultant product is a plant and machinery and like I said authorities are reading immobile property to mean some total of civil work plus plant and machinery so what should be the test now one of the fundamental test would be if there is a creation of plant and machinery is that plant and machinery created to give a specific outcome or specific result out of that plant and machinery or is it just a mere extension of enjoyment of immobile property like let's take an example of easy ducting system or fire extinguishing system now definitely these items will qualify as machinery because they are giving you a specific result so the specific result is uh, a good air conditioning in the room and in case of fire extinguishing uh, system it is the prevention of fire but these items as a process as a combination they have their own utility purpose and end result you can get something specific out of it if you will not use or if you will not set up these devices with the more property then you cannot get these outcomes. So to the extent these things are giving a specific outcomes, it qualifies to be a plant in machinery. Even a fan which is being attached to the involved property qualifies to be a plant in machinery. And same goes for lighting because lighting fans, these have their own independent end results, which gives you uh, a specific measurable outcome. It should not be read as an extension of enjoyment of involved property. If we start giving such a wide definition to an involved property, then unfortunately everything which is being screwed to an involved property that fails to qualify as plant machinery. Something which is not creating the end result and that's uh, you know, a part and parcel of immoral property would only be construed as in, uh, uh, a concept under the concept of immoral property, like a window or a gate. Now, these will not give you a specific end result. These are only convenience factor which is being embedded in the immoral property. So, expenses on gates, windows, those should be a part and parcel of immoral property. So if there is a works contract service in relation to windows or gates, those should be considered as works contract service for immobile property and hence credit should not be allowed. But if it is a works contract service which results into AC system, HVAC systems, fire fighting systems, lighting, etc., then this is an extension on plant and machinery. Immovability test is irrelevant for plant and machinery, and in these cases, credit on this box contract service should be allowed. So this should be the benchmark or test to understand this concept. So we have covered this 17.5 C in detail. We will now move to the other part. 17.5 D is more or less similar here. The distinction in instead of box contract, there it could be any goods and service. It is again used for construction, creation of removal property other than plant and machinery on his own account. 
Now, one is only don't would mean that uh, you know you are using these services for creation of more property which you will use. Like you are constructing your house, whatever expense you will incur, those will not be available as credit. You are constructing a mall. Again, authorities have read that this is being constructed on your own account. For the leasing, letting out is debatable. We'll discuss. But for the moment, if something is being constructed for your own account, then credit is not available on those expenses. Cap the concept of capitalization we have discussed. So uh, with this, we are through with the first section. We'll now move to the judicial pronouncement because uh, this is going to be the eye opener how authorities have read the concept. So the first category of judicial announcement is on the business debt. Like I said, if you have to claim credit, we have to pass the twin test. Test of section 16 that it has to be a business expense, and test of section 17 that it is not to be excluded from the category of 17.5 C or D. Now, in case of business test, I say that whatever expense has been routinely incurred for repair and maintenance in relation to factory or the premise from where you are providing output service, credit will be admissible. But if it has some connection with the personal consumption, or if these are dedicated to something which are more used by employee, not by business, then uh, this subjectivity comes in. Now we have a ruling in case of national ammonium, it's a advanced ruling by Gujarat. Uh, the nature of expense was repair and maintenance for residential colonies, case house, and hospitals. They are held that credit is not available on these expense because it's not a business expense. This is more in the nature of personal consumption, etc. So they have started diluting these uh, uh, expenses, uh, credit on these expenses uh, from the business standpoint. Construction expense, I say, much debated topic in the present regime. Let us see what kinds of rulings have come up. The first and foremost. I think whosoever is there in GST, this is a ruling which is being learned by heart. It's a safari retreat ruling. Uh, and then there is kind of uh, uh, rulings by various other high courts, the Daily International Airport and Marti Airtel, where the taxpayer has actually challenged the constitutional validity of section 17.5c and 17.5d. Now, what, what do we mean if we say they have challenged the constitutional validity, which means they said that you can't bring this provision, which means you have to give credit on these expenses under 16 only. You will not apply 17.5c and 17.5d because uh, in case of safari retreat, it, it is uh, kind of a, a hotel. So as we see that if you are letting out the property, then credit is not available. Uh, for the moment, the matter is being pending in Supreme Court, so the final outcome is pending uh, in, in these scenarios. Then we have a ruling in case of Vardhan Holiday, it's a, a, a AR ruling. The subject matter was input tax credit on construction of hotel buildings and banquet halls. Now, this is a ruling which is relevant for 17.5D because here these are as per the authorities. These are the constructions which have been done for your own account. Uh, and credit is not available. Uh, same logic they have applied in case of mother arts and Dinga trucking, where there was a warehouse which was to be let out. So if the output service is going to be a renting or letting out, and if you have incurred an expense of construction or creation of remote property, and as per 17.5D, authorities are not allowing credit on these items. Now, you may say that it's illogical because uh, uh, we are paying uh, GST on the output side, but for the moment, we are not getting credit on input side. But this is the way they have created uh, the negative risk provision. So, even if you are constructing a uh, building that has been further let out on which renters are being charged, GST is being paid, still input tax credit is not accessible. There are few set of expenses which are not directly related to construction, but which have an indirect nexus before or after the commencement of construction work. Let us see what is the ruling on these parts. The first ruling is in case of Dean Dayal Court. It's an advanced ruling by Gujarat. Now here the subject matter was ITC on construction of residential areas, park and industrial park. Authority said that you know it is a clear case of 17.5c where it is a books contract service for creation of income property and credit is not allowed. 
in case of ggl hotels there the taxpayer was has taken a land on lease they were paying lease rental for those land so if you have to start the construction you need a land suppose there was a contract now there was uh, i'll say a, a period where there was no construction let's say period of 3 months so the subject matter was what will happen to the itc of lease rentals which are incurred in before the commencement of construction they have already said that you know credit will not be available because it it these are services in relation to construction of the building now in our view they have given a very wide interpretation of this clause because let's take an example you took a land on lease to pay it rent for three months and for some reason you commercially decided not to commence the construction if construction never commences then 175c 175d will not apply and whatever expenses you incurred on lease part those are your business expense under 16 so credit should have been available so in our view pre operative expenses before the commencement of actual construction from a gst standpoint credit should be available because these are not the expenses in relation to construction there would be other examples like security services you hire security services for looking out the area before you commence the construction there could be an architect fee so if you really look at it these expense will have some nexus but you know it is still possible that you may choose or you may decide not to commence the construction before or even if you have incurred those expenses so in our view until the construction has started 175c 175d would cover only those expenses which started incurred by the taxpayer at the time when the construction commences credit on those expenses should only be debarred under these provisions next part deals with repair and maintenance it will also deal with capex expense of building in case of jabalpur entertainment itc on maintenance and renovations of mall and multiplex was the question here it was the revenue expenditure charged to pnl credit should have been allowed because this was nowhere allowed, nowhere debarred but uh, somehow authority took a contrary view they said that even if you are booking it in revenue expense etc doesn't matter so they completely ignored the capitalization criteria that credit is debarred only when expense is been capitalized here the authority went ahead beyond the statutory provision and held that even if that's been kept, even if that's been charged to pnl still credit is not accessible in case of rambar palace the subject matter was the pnl maintenance of building electrical and sanitary fitting so they partially allowed the credit that's been charged to pnl but they denied the credit to the extent of capitalization now i will agree with the first part where the expense relates to building but on the second part which is electrical and sanitary fitting like i said these much these this qualifies to be a plant and machinery they have their independent function and independent outcome irrespective of building even though they will be attached to the building so to that extent they are covered under the definition of plant and machinery and immovability movability criteria is not relevant so credit should have been allowed but unfortunately authority denied this credit let's go ahead and see the jurus property what did qualify to be a movable property why is it important to retrade if something is not plant and machinery then credit is available only if box contract service or construction service results in creation of movable property if construction service is created immovable property then credit is disallowed hence this test of movability immovability is important in case of vivak india is a triple a ruling of karnataka the subject matter was detachable wooden flooring sliding and stacked glass partition authority allowed the credit on the ground that these items qualifies to be property and hence matter was very structure which has pillar and three faces and in case of embassy industrial park the subject matter was there 
which was created using said that the annexation and intention is to create a immoral property for permanent benefit. Since these structures are going to be there for a longer period, for almost a lifetime, hence there is no intention for movement, so they qualify to be immovable property. So expenses on construction of these immovable property is disallowed. We have a next ruling in case of Vindhya Delhi links, where the subject matter was installation of cable of telecommunication sector, clients of telecommunication sector. Authority held that the telecommunic uh, this cable qualifies to be credit would be allowed. Like I said at the start of the session, that it actually depends on fact and circumstances. We can only decide or we can only lay down the three four test to decide uh, the movement or movability of an item. So there cannot be a straight jacket format. Only come on the fact of the case, uh, it needs to be taken. And at the same time, I am acknowledging that uh, because of such a complexity in the subject, authorities have their own point of view in deciding what is movable, what is immovable, etc. On plant and machine because yeah. we felt like this going to be did a very detailed analysis of a particular new construction contract and uh, where they gave a point by point answer in terms of electrical fittings, plant and machinery, lifts, sewage, AC, civil work, etc. What should be allowed? So they said that all these items qualifies to be the plant and machinery and credit was allowed. Now, interestingly, in this scenario, it was the SSC was getting most contract services for this. So they went and they they did a very rational interpretation of uh, section 17.5, and they said that what is plant and machinery credit will be allowed even if the billing is a most contract. What is not credit is not allowed. Uh, on civil part, they decided the credit to some extent. I say that there were few elements of uh, plant and machinery, but. Uh, they kind of took a view that uh, students have not taken up the rational taken in Nipro India. Uh, they have given interpretation that uh, in your property is submission of civil work plus plant and machinery. You will Here it was a property or part and parcel of immovable property. Please don't segregate plant and machinery out of it. NTMC Limited, Triple A R uh, on the issue of private railway sliding. They said that it's it's an immovable property. So Petrival Amusement Park. Extent of those civil structure, the credit credit is also allowed. So they allow credit on plant and machinery, and they also allow credit on support structure. Uh, on the pure civil work, which was relating to land preparation work, construction of machine room, they disallow the credit, saying it is not a plant and machine. Now, considering all this jurisprudence and law at hand, what should be the Power for taxpayer deal with these contracts. You know, first and foremost, I think give emphasis to the capitalization criteria because if the expense is revenue in nature, then credit is allowed. Effective of getting into the debate uh, whether it's an immovable property, immovable property, plant and machine. But the moment it has been capitalized, then whole debate subjectivity comes into. And who will decide whether it would be passed through revenue or expense? It is uh, or capitalized. It is you along with your auditor. So first suggestion is that you know let's be in more touch with your statutory auditor to understand uh, whether the expense would be a revenue expense or capital expense. 
Second, if it is a capital lens, then to the extent can be under respective then the recommended capitalization uh, of it what we have seen the moment expenses of plant and machinery are being capitalized in the value of land authority take a view that this is the creation of immoral property so credit should not be allowed another recommendation is we should have a separate contracts and purchase orders for civil work and non civil work along with separate invoicing this further strengthen the case that you know x thing is plant and machinery so credit should be admissible irrespective of movability test and why thing is plant and machinery so credit is not uh, permissible in case we have no choice but to go with single contract with the single service then again the advice is let's have civil work like electrical plumbing plant and machinery etc and get separate invoices for that even under a single contract to the extent the expense pertains to plant and machinery electrical fittings etc credit can be claimed hsns a guiding factor if possible let's get hsns uh, item wise to the extent it is pertaining to plant and machinery then two points Uh, are more relevant from the perspective since there are a lot of development which are happening on the input tax credit pertaining to construction contract and in a lot of cases you have seen that on similar issue like in case of 175c and challenging the constitutionality uh, people have filed writ petitions etc uh, similarly there could be upcoming writ petitions on interpretations or uh, of planter machinery etc so what what can next be done is that we can keep track of this latest development and wherever we strongly believe that credit be admissible but litigated so instead of taking and paying interest if it goes on toss it's better that we go file a writ petition for that keep our claim alive and then when if a favorable outcome is being given by the high court then at that point in time we can claim the credit so with this uh, we will end our session so we would be happy to take up uh, uh, the when is uh, that's been shared by the participant uh, we would only be addressing q and a which are relevant uh, for the present session so i will restrict my comments only to q and a uh, which are relevant for the content we have discussed okay let's go down there is a question from so shiba engage in the business of letting out property on land please tell the rights on following goods and services uh, are allowed with heating ventilation air conditioning uh, so yes sir because these qualifies to be the plant and machinery so there is no restriction under 75 uh, we have discussed this in detail so you can claim credit uh, uh, on these expenses Next question is from Vikram Vijay. Uh, can ITC be claimed on building repair if it is of revenue nature as per the order? Yes, there is no doubt in that. Law clearly gives you this option, and uh, uh, there is only one negative advance ruling on that part. But we can conveniently ignore that. Can ITC be claimed on purchase of commercial property for own business use or giving on rental basis? Sir, we discussed that uh, the issue of five. Treat and the other expenses are being incurred for further renting or let out, so credit will not be uh, available. Uh, go. Okay. Then we have a question from Vikas. ITC for construction of warehouse to be used for lease and renting, sir, uh, not allowed. There is a negative area on this. And like a reiterate, authorities are reading this to be under Section 17.5D, that's the construction on newer account. Uh, there are rent petitions which are being filed. If you have a major capex and uh, uh, you wanted to earn credit on construction of warehouse which is being used for lease or rent, I should say, sir, you have a merit in your argument. You can be a party to a rent petition or you can file your own rent petition uh, to get this credit. Uh, there is a question from Vritti Makija: Electricity transformer will become part of mobile property or plant and machinery. 
uh, man, it would be plant and machinery because it has its own function and end result irrespective of minimal property. So it would be plant and machinery that it would be available. We have a question from Lavi Nahar. If we are doing site creating ground improvement for entire plant area, where we will have plant and machinery and also human property. How can we take ITC? We are preparing quota cabins for furniture. And then it will be admissible for ITC. Okay, so uh, on the first part, when there is a site improvement for plant and machinery, I should say that credit should be available. Uh, in case of quota cabin, uh, uh, if it qualifies to be furniture, again, ITC would be available, but uh, again, the test of movability needs to be checked from that perspective. If it results in creation of involved property, then credit can be distributed. Uh, then there is a question about wall painting, tile work. Is it covered under involved property? Can we take ITC? Uh, seems, this seems to be a revenue expense, not capitalization expense, so credit is available. In case that's been capitalized, so to the extent of Capitalization credit is not available. Can we get ITC on under constructed property? Uh, sir, under constructed property will have GST and you can only get if you will use it for further sale, otherwise, not. GST on free area, I cannot answer that because that's uh, GST rate on real estate projects. Uh, ITC allowed on laying of cable work underground for power connection. Uh, Okay, I say fact based, but yes, Tanapes I allowed because uh, uh, power connection would be plant and machinery and it is an expense for that. Uh, then again, questions on washroom taps, wash basins, pipes. Okay, uh, as per Nepro AR, credit is allowed, but there are other ARs which have held this to be a part of involved property. So, debated because it's been capitalized, but legally it is allowed. Then there is a question that if we are a multi specialist hospitals, we procure surgery equipment, lab, etc. Can we claim ITC? Yes, these are in the nature of plant and machinery. You can claim ITC. The only problem would be because your sector is exempt from GST. How would you use that credit? But that's the separate part. But yes, from a legal standpoint on 17.5, you can claim credit. Uh, can we take credit? The next question is from Lobby Nahar. Can we take credit of temporary structures? erected during the constructions of plant site. Okay, if these are temporary, yes, credit can be claimed. ITC on lamination on glass doors or wallpapers or walls. ITC on ceiling work and composite panels. Okay, yes, it, it is available. Then there is a, there is a uh, question, we have a huge civil work at plant site, how can we optimize credit? Okay, I just give few tips uh, on this part. See, a lot of uh, Contracts are being given end to end, which has the element of civil, electric, plumbing, everything. Uh, like I said in the way forward slide, if you can break up the cost and billings in the existing contract, the credit to the extent of plant and machinery can be claimed. Or you can go for, uh, uh, I'll say, uh, a separate contract. If it it is plain vanilla civil work, and if it is a huge civil work, then there is no option because as per the government scheme, credit on civil part is not allowed. Then there is a question from Mr. Heyman, ITC on sports equipment, gym equipment, uh, etc. Is it allowed? Sir, I say it is more relevant from section 16. Uh, credit is allowed, but it, it's going to be always debatable. Uh, there are few tribunal rulings to support your standpoint, but I should acknowledge that this is not a very clean case. It's going to be debatable. ITC on fixture. You have to understand uh, the movability or immovability test. If it is immovable, not allowed. If it is movable, it is allowed. Okay. Uh, then there is a question on uh, uh, ITC on lift annual maintenance. Sir, it is allowed. It is a revenue expenditure. Go down. Uh, is my voice audible? I, I am seeing two comments where it is being stated voice is not audible. Uh, Gora, you are audible now. Okay, okay. Let's go down. Okay. So there is a very interesting question from Mr. Chirag Mehta. The question is: uh, There is a works contract. Uh, uh, is ITC available to works contractor on procuring material? 
Yes, it is available if your output is also a box contract service. Then the next question is: If I provide interior decoration service, will my client get ITC for movable items like antique electrical fittings supplied by me? Uh, electrical fitting, yes, uh, it qualifies to be a plant and machinery. Uh, interior decoration services, uh, uh, sir, in our view, credit is available, but the only point is uh, there are few judgments in which authorities have. You know, read this uh, uh, service in relation to construction. If you remember, I mentioned that uh, air construction would be need in a very strict manner to include only those services which are available after commencement of construction, not before. So, if these are services before construction, then allowed. If these are services after completion of construction, allowed. But if it is given in between, then credit will not be available. Credit will only be available of electrical fittings. Then the question is what accounting standards to follow? Cost account for works contract as contract, etc. Uh, yes, in real estate, cost accounting standard will work. So then books, okay. I can't comment on that. Okay. Let's go down. There's a question from do construction of hostels for the purpose of letting out, sir. I again reiterate credit will not be available even if you are letting out. Plus, uh, hostel qualifies to be a residential accommodation. GST, anyway, is exempt from hostel revenues. If you have not thought about it, please uh, think about it. You will not, you are not supposed to judge GST on that. Okay, go down. There is, there is no questions on centralized AC. Like I said, yes, credit will be a principle on centralized AC. Okay, go down. Okay, go down. There is one specific question from Bitanji uh, ITC on lease rent paid. Ma'am, legally credit should be available. Uh, there are few negative advanced rulings, but in our view, uh, like we are reading the law, it should only cover uh, charges which are incurred after commencement of construction. So, uh, if the lease rents are paid to get the land before the commencement of construction, then credit to that extent should be available. Any industry. Okay, so we are through with uh, all the uh, questions. So, Mitaji, the, the clients have asked. So, please let me know the way forward. Thank you, Gaurav, for this insightful presentation. This is a definitely added to our knowledge on the topic. I appreciate the subject matter and thank you for precisely explaining it to our audience. I also thank the participants for being so cooperative. Thank you all for taking time out of your busy schedule and joining us in this session to make it a success. Though Gaurav has tried to reply to the queries raised during this session, yet in case you have any further questions, you may please send them to us in writing at sales at .com. Thank you all once again. We shall soon be back with another vital topic. Till then, stay safe and have a great time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.